The largest land animal, the elephant, was used by kingdoms and empires within antiquity for multiple reasons. This variety of uses of the elephant ranged from political, social and military. Once the elephant had been tamed by humans, the military world changed. No longer were the rules of engagement simple, where infantry clashed together and cavalry fought for the dominance of the flanks. Now animals weighing 5,000 kilograms were stampeding towards lines of men who may have never seen a beast like this before. These are commonly referred to as the tanks of antiquity, and that may be with good reason. Hello and welcome to the 10th episode of the AIQ podcast. My name is Alexander Goodman and on this podcast we are discussing war elephants. Were they a success or a failure? First of all, I'd just like to apologise if you find anything off my voice today. I'm quite ill, but I'm going to crack on with the podcast anyway. And I also just want to apologise for the lack of uploads. Um, I've been finishing off my Masters and I had a lot of time pumped into that. But now I'm back and we should be uploading fairly frequently from now on. So thank you for sticking around anyway. In this episode, we are going to mostly be talking about the military aspect and the political aspect of war elephants. So we're not going to really talk about their biological features or how long you know it takes for them to give birth or breed in captivity or even hunting them in the wild. But if you are interested in that, I would really recommend you go and listen to the Age of Giants episode by the Hellenistic Age podcast. They do a really good job there. So go check them out as well once you've done listening to this podcast. So, the war elephant. Now, for us it is clear that the Hellenistic kingdoms brought the exotic elephant to the forefront of warfare in the Mediterranean. The Seleucids, through their contact with the Indian kingdoms, had access to the Indian elephants, and the Ptolemies, although starting with Indian elephants, then turned to the African forest elephant, which is commonly found in Ethiopia. This meant the Ptolemies held a monopoly over these elephants, as did the Seleucids of the Indian elephant. Towards the end of the 3rd century BC, elephants were less commonly used in warfare as the African forest elephant evidently declined in population due to the overhunting in the wild because of their use in war and in the ivory trade, but also due to their difficulty of breeding elephants in captivity. The Indian elephant also became less commonly used because the Seleucid Empire lost large parts of its territory in Bactria and Parthia and these were essential satrapies to allow trade with India. In the Hellenistic period as a whole though, elephants were considered to have three main features in warfare, and the first one was they were used as a screen against cavalry, which is clear at the Battle of Ipsus in 301 BC. Plutarch describes Demetrius as routing Antiochus the first cavalry far away from the battle lines. However, upon his return, Demetrius had found that Seleucus I had created a screen of elephants in front of his infantry line that blocked the horses from attacking. Horses don't really like elephants, they dislike the smell and the noise, and are quite timid to go and fight them. The second use in warfare was to engage lines of infantry, and this was quite simple. Elephants would stampede into lines of infantry. This was to either inflict massive casualties upon their lines and disrupt their organisation for the allied infantry to then capitalise upon the disarray, or they could engage the infantry to keep them there so then they could do other things on the flanks, but they could either be used to destroy their lines or they could be there to hold an attack off. The third use of elephants in warfare was their use against fortifications and sieges. However, this is far less common, but one example is the siege of Megalopolis, where it was unsuccessful when the elephants attempted to break down the city walls and gates. They were met with nailed doors and studded trenches, which caused immense pain to the elephants underfoot. This caused the elephants to refuse to move forward or backwards. This led them to be stranded to missile units up upon the walls, which killed the mahouts who were driving the elephants, or made the elephants unwilling to obey their mahouts and retreat. Instead, due to the missiles and the pain they already had, they panicked and trampled their own men behind them. However, the few that stayed and continued to press the city walls, or were stuck in place, were rendered useless and failed to enter the city. After 300 BC, Larger elephants started to be equipped with towers on their back in the Hellenistic world, where two or four men could man the towers with missiles. There are also arguments from scholars such as Michael Sage and Adrian Goldsworthy, where armour was developed to protect the elephant, including armour specifically for their tusks. However, more recent scholarship have countered this argument and have argued that elephant armour wasn't really present until the medieval period. 
We do know some information though about how elephants were organised in the Hellenistic armies. If we are to believe Asclepiodotus, each elephant was ridden by a mahout, who were trained in the Indian style. Two elephants had a two animal commander, which made up a singular elephant unit. Four elephant units, which is a total of eight elephants, were under the control of a senior animal commander. Eight elephant units, which is a total of 16 elephants, was run by an ilark. Sixteen elephant units, which is 32 elephants, was run by an elephant leader. And now we get to very large numbers. So 32 units was run by a wing commander and 64 units was run by a phalanx leader. Now, this description is considered by some to be true, however, it is also debated and questioned due to the practicality of so many leaders in this formation. Now, in the Carthaginian army, elephants, specifically the North African elephant, were used, as Goldworthy believes, as trampling weapons, as there supposedly is no evidence to suggest that Carthaginian elephants had towers where missile troops could fire out of. However, it is important to note that the elephants probably were strong enough to have towers and it may just be we haven't found any evidence yet. Similarly to the Hellenistic elephants, they were also ridden by a mahout who was in control of the elephant. Due to the nature of elephants, if they panicked and turned on their own men, they could have devastated impacts to their own line. So these mahouts were given two tools to counteract this happening, and that was a hammer and a chisel-shaped knife. This was to drive the knife into the neck of the beast to bring it down before it could inflict any casualties on its own men. Before engagement, what is quite interesting when I did my research is that the Carthaginians would supply the elephants with wine before the fight to increase their erratic behaviour, so they would be trumpeting and stampeding a lot more violently, and apparently this is to instil fear into the enemy, which is quite like modern day Dutch courage in a way. Within the Roman period though, elephants were only used on occasions and so were reduced mainly to just a ceremonial role, but we will talk about some occasions that they are used in the Roman army. So now let's talk about some of the positive impacts that war elephants made in battles during antiquity. At the Battle of Hydaspes, there is a good example of how elephants were used in war. The Indian king Porus positioned his elephants, which were between 85 and 200 elephants, in front of his infantry line. This was in order to deter the Macedonian cavalry from charging straight into the infantry. This worked and allowed the elephants to then actually charge the Macedonian infantry line. The elephants initially caused mayhem upon the Macedonian line, inflicting many casualties into the phalanx. This does eventually turn around though, and although the elephants were initially very successful, Porus does ultimately lose the battle, and the elephants were routed, which I'll explain on a bit later in the negatives. After the death of Alexander, many of the Hellenistic kingdoms adopted the use of elephants, with both the Seleucids and the Ptolemies both trying to increase the size of their elephants' cores. Although these elephants were used in pitched battles, it is difficult to see how effective they really were because normally they'd be fighting the other elephants. This is shown at the Battle of Raphia. However, in 162 BC, Lysias, a Seleucid general and governor during Antiochus V Eupator's reign, used 30 war elephants against the Maccabean army led by Judah Maccabee and Eleazar. Upon the sight of these elephants, the Jewish infantry started to waver instantly and started to break in the rear. The psychological impact of the elephants was so effective against the Jewish infantry that one of the Jewish leaders, Eleazar, tried to show that the beasts were vulnerable and single-handedly slaughtered an elephant by spearing its stomach. However, the elephant died but fell upon him and killed him as well. This act of strength was not enough to recover the morale of the Jews who were defeated by the Seleucids. With regards to the Carthaginian war elephants, you can see their positive impact in battles, specifically at the Battle of Bagradus River in 255 BC. The terrific use of elephants is evident where a renowned victory for the Carthaginians was secured by Xanthippus. It is considered one of the most striking victories in the whole of the Punic Wars that was achieved by elephants alone. They managed to engage the infantry and pin the Romans down. This is probably because of their deployment of six lines, where the men were so tightly packed in formation that if the front line wanted to start to break, they couldn't actually go past the rest of their men, and so they were stuck there. 
Once the elephants had retreated, the Romans were very tired and they'd used all their peeler up. So when the Carthaginian phalanx engaged them, they were unable to break through and were decisively defeated by the Carthaginian cavalry, who won their flank and then engaged the Romans from the behind. Most of the Romans were either killed in that flank with the attack or upon their retreat. It is argued that this victory was largely due to the contribution of the elephants, which attained Carthage a vital victory resulting in 12,000 killed Romans and 500 captured, with only 800 Carthaginian losses in the whole battle. This battle sent shockwaves through the Roman armies, as they did not dare face another Carthaginian army in the open land in Sicily. The effect that the elephants had on the Roman armies lasted for some time, showing how much of a physical asset the elephants could be for the Carthaginians, but also a psychological aspect upon their enemy. The psychological aspect is also apparent in Hannibal's crossing of the Alps, where raids were happening from nearby Gallic tribes, but they were not attacking where the elephants were positioned due to fear of these beasts. As we mentioned earlier, when we talk about Rome, mostly they have turned elephants into more of a ceremonial aspect. But there is an account at the Battle of Kenekephali, where the usefulness of elephants' psychological impact is very evident. The Romans were losing the battle on their left flank, and so engaged the elephants on the Macedonian right flank against Philip V's army. Upon seeing these beasts, the phalanx instantly turned and routed. This allowed the Romans to then attack the remaining Macedonian army on the other flank, turning a potential loss to a resounding success for the Romans, where they managed to kill over half of the Macedonian army. So there are a few examples throughout antiquity where you can see elephants having a big impact into battles, where they were quite successful. However, we now need to talk about the negative aspects that it brought, and I do have to admit this list is quite long. So let's get started. So getting back to the Battle of the Hydaspes inside Alexander's campaign, you can see that despite the initial success of the Porus's elephants, the Macedonians were able to rout them with their phalanx. They do this by having light infantry throw javelins at the mahouts and the eyes of the elephants, while the heavy infantry attempted to hamstring the legs of the elephants. This strategy meant that once the elephants had been routed, this meant the mahouts could not kill the elephants before they stampeded, which is what happened, and the elephants turned on the Indian infantry behind them. This actually resulted in Porus losing the battle, as the elephants inflicted heavy casualties onto his infantry line. This battle shows how elephants were a two-edged sword, that when used effectively they could deal massive damage to the opposing army, whilst also having the potential to inflict damage upon their own allies. Now in the Hellenistic period, you can see at the Battle of Raphia, the Ptolemies and Seleucids elephants clashed with each other. Polybius describes this battle in quite a lot of graphic detail, but the most important point he makes is that the Ptolemaic elephants were much smaller in stature than the Seleucid elephants, and therefore fled from them and stampeded through the Ptolemaic left wing, purely because they just didn't want to fight the bigger, better elephants. This caused the Ptolemies to cede large amount of ground on the flank, and they almost lost the battle because of the unreliability of these elephants in battle. Again, at the Battle of Magnesia, you can see how elephants were a detrimental factor to their army. Antiochus III engaged the Romans, but started off quite badly. He lost the left flank of his army because of a failed attack by his chariots. At the same time, Antiochus had actually routed the Roman left flank, but had chased them too far all the way back to the Roman camp. This left the elephants in the middle of the army, with the infantry surrounded by the Roman right flank, and the central infantry line. The Seleucid phalanx then formed squares around the elephants to try and retreat away from the battle. However, the Romans didn't engage the phalanx lines, but instead just sent missiles into the elephants. This then caused the elephants that were in the centre of these squares to panic, and they then attacked the inside of the phalanxes. This was then capitalised on by the Romans, who slaughtered the infantry and were victorious. The elephants, although not responsible for the loss of the Seleucid flanks, were the final straw that destroyed the Seleucid army and potentially Antiochus III's future military capabilities. Within the Punic Wars, you can see quite a few problematic scenarios where elephants are actually detrimental to the Carthaginians. One of those examples is at the Battle of Panormus in 250 BC, where the elephant's vulnerability to missiles is very, very clear. 
The elephant corps, when subjected to heavy bombardment, panicked and were either captured or set upon their own troops, which was then capitalised by, capitalised on by, yeah, which was then capitalised on by the Romans, who sprung a surprise flank attack into the Carthaginian army. This resulted in the Romans obtaining victory due to the elephant's vulnerability to missiles. This is again seen at another battle, the, the Battle of Illipa in 206 BC, where 32 elephants were nullified due to the heavy missile bombardment causing them to stampede out of control. However, as many of you know, the most famous account of the elephant's vulnerability was present at the Battle of Zama in 202 BC. At this point, the Romans had learnt quite a lot about how to fight the Carthaginian elephants and deployed a formation of triplux aches. However, the Manipals, which is a group of the Principes, were stationed behind the Hastati, but not slightly to the left or the right, but directly behind like a column. And behind them, they had the Terrarii, also directly behind them in a column. This meant that there was massive gaps between the groups of soldiers, which would allow a channel to be formed whenever they wished. However, Scipio Africanus hid these channels by putting Velites, which is a missile unit, into these channels so that Hannibal was not aware that these channels existed. At the very start of the battle, some of the 80 elephants that were deployed by Hannibal actually panicked and turned on their own Numidian cavalry. This was then exploited by the Romans, where Scipio ordered a charge to happen onto that flank. This resulted in the Carthaginian cavalry being routed on that flank. The elephants then charged into the Roman infantry, but it was to no avail because they got harassed by missile bombardments by those velites in the channels that I was just talking about. This then led to most of those elephants either panicking and running away or going through the channels not looking to engage in any units. However, a few of the elephants did in fact manage to hit the infantry. Some ended up charging the right flank of the Romans. However, these were also repelled by missiles. And so those elephants turned and then charged the Carthaginian right flank as well. This was then again capitalised by the Romans, who then charged the Carthaginian flank, which was in disarray because of the elephants, managing to rout them. The elephants in the Battle of Zama had failed to inflict many casualties on the Romans, and had effectively destroyed both flanks of the Carthaginian cavalry, leaving Hannibal without support against the Roman infantry, who had spare cavalry to come back to the battle from routing the Carthaginians, to then finish off the remaining Carthaginian infantry. It is considered by modern scholarship that if the elephants had not been so ineffective that Hannibal stood a fair chance of a victory of some sorts, as his infantry was deployed specifically to deal with Scipio's renowned infantry. Now let's look specifically at the Romans, or at least conflicts that happened with the Romans involved. So another weakness of war elephants was that they were very easily frightened by unusual noises. One such noise, which seems to have been used against war elephants several times in the ancient world, was their fear of squealing pigs. The most famous example of this was deployed by the Romans, who, according to Ilion, in his work on the characteristics of animals, used pigs to scare the war elephants of Pyrrhus during the Pyrrhic Wars. This weakness is also exploited by the Megarians against the war elephants of Antigonus II Gonatas during the latter siege of Megara. According to Ilion, the defenders of Megara tried to lift the siege by sending out hordes of pigs that were set on fire. This was in order to terrify and panic the enemy's war elephants. This worked and the elephants in typical fashion stampeded through their own army infantry lines and killed enough of Antigonus' men that he had to lift the siege. As you can see, a lot of these accounts have two things in common, that is the vulnerability to missiles and the fact that elephants very easily would stampede and kill their own men, which, again, as we said earlier, is a two-edged blade because they could easily inflict a lot of casualties upon their enemies, but at the same time, they could be even more detrimental to their own side. So, moving on from their positives and negatives, we're now going to look at one of the biggest uncertainties around elephants in antiquity, and that is the so-called elephant victory. The elephant victory was a victory won by Antiochus I Sota, king of the Seleucid Empire, who was victorious over the Galatians in the 270-ish BC. The elephant victory aspect of this battle has now come into question because of an article written by Altai Koshkun in 2012 who re-examined the evidence of the event and has therefore presented many questions about whether there were even elephants present at the battle at all. 
The first point to say is that none of the surviving fragments of Hellenistic historians mention this battle at all, and neither does some more later historians such as Strabo, Livy, or of Memnon of Heraclea when they refer to the reign of Antiochus I. So, in absence of any solid literary evidence for this event, historians have pointed to four other pieces of evidence to justify the claims of Antiochus having indeed an elephant victory. There is a statue of an elephant holding a Galatian shield in its trunk found in Southern Asia Minor. Appian of Alexandria, who writes that Antiochus defeated the Galatians and expelled them from Asia Minor, which is how he earned the title Sota, meaning saviour. The third is an excerpt from a Byzantine encyclopedia which mentions the poet Simonides, who lived under Antiochus the so-called Great, and wrote that this Antiochus, the so-called Great One, defeated the Galatians by overrunning their cavalry with elephants. The fourth piece of evidence is a satirical account from Lucian of Samosata, which details Antiochus I's elephant victory. So now we have those four pieces of evidence, let's pick them apart to understand if actually this elephant victory occurred. So to start with, the statue of the elephant with the glacier shield. This has been assumed to be a commemorative trophy celebrating the elephant victory as such, and it was found in Asia Minor, as I've already mentioned, where the battle is said to have happened. This features iconography of the Galatians who were supposed to be the ones defeated in this battle. However, the elephant in the statue is anatomically much more similar to the African elephants than the Indian elephants that the Seleucids would have used. It was also found in a part of Asia Minor that would have been controlled by the Ptolemies at the time and not the Seleucids. This then raises quite a strange question as to why are the Seleucids defending the Ptolemaic territories? Whilst we cannot fully dismiss the possibility that this is a commemorative trophy to celebrate the elephant victory, these two problems with the narrative that I've raised make it much more difficult to believe the original interpretation of the evidence. With regard to Appian's brief mention of Antiochus the first victory over the Galatians, there are more problems with using this to point to it being an elephant victory. Mainly, this is that Appian doesn't mention elephants here at all. Therefore, it should be easy to see why we can just dismiss this piece of evidence altogether. The other problem is that Appian implies that Antiochus I expelled the Galatians out of Asia Minor back into Europe, which just is not true. The Galatians, in fact, remained in Asia Minor as a distinguished ethnic group, at least until the 1st century BC. The third piece of evidence was the Byzantine Encyclopedia, which is also problematic. Mainly, it was written close to a thousand years after the reign of Antiochus I, so its validity as a historical source is already open for debate. Another problem with it is that Antiochus I, in any of the literary or epigraphical records, is never called Antiochus the so-called Great. Antiochus I's primary epithet was Sota, which meant saviour, where Antiochus III's was Omegas, which meant the Great. But his reign started 50 or so years after the Battle of the Galatians is supposed to have taken place. And outside of this Byzantine reference, no mention is ever made to an Antiochus, the so-called Great. This is the only time it seems to appear. So who was Simonides, which the encyclopedia was referencing? The sheer gap in time between the encyclopedia and the battle is, makes it really hard to interpret away these obvious mistakes, so it's probably shouldn't be considered a useful source of information to this period of history. And finally, there's the account of Lucian. This may take a little bit of time because we've really got to tear this apart to understand it. As I mentioned earlier, Lucian is a satirist, and so therefore the elephant victory is a piece of satire. The account hinges on the idea that people only react to fins in certain ways because they are unusual. Lucian gives some examples of this. The first of these is Lucian's own account of him giving a lecture in a city where he discusses a lot of oddities and weird stuff. Once he's finished with the lecture, as he's returning home, a passerby talks to him and says about how much he enjoyed the lecture, because of all the weird and crazy stuff that was involved in it. Lucian then takes this and gets a bit depressed, because he understands that he is not liked because of who he was or the wit that he said it in, but it was because of the content of the speech. This is also seen in another example later on, but I won't mention this here. But you can see there's a trend that 
people are only getting excited over the weird and crazy stuff that's happening. Now, when he talks about the elephant victory, he is referring to this format of satire. So Lucian goes on to explain the elephant victory and how two armies met in the battle. The Galatian army was organised into different sections with rigid and disciplined formations and the Seleucid army as a disarrayed, inexperienced army who was scared and disorganised. So obviously, already, it seems a bit odd because the Seleucid army normally would be very disciplined. I have no idea why they are now turned into a rabble. Then as the Galatians approach closer and they see the elephants, instantly they are filled with fear and dread to face these, and so they turn around and rout instantly. This allows Antiochus to proclaim the victory his, as he destroyed the whole army in one battle. However, after this event, Antiochus, as did Lucian, gets depressed because he realises he didn't win the battle because of his masterful plans or the, even the fact that his army was better. It was just the fact that he held some weird and unusual creatures inside this army and that is the only reason he won. So this is clearly just a satirical account. The army descriptions are obviously there for reverse for this ancient joke. In fact, the Galatian army very closely parallels the description of Antiochus III's army at the Battle of Magnesia against the Romans. A similarity that is very possibly intentional. And then to follow on to that, Antiochus I's bout of depression after the battle is clearly fabricated to fit the satiric narrative. So if all these pieces of evidence that back up the elephant victory have got problems in them, as we've just demonstrated, can we really believe the narrative of the elephant victory? Well, we certainly can't say for sure, but if the validity of one of the greatest examples of the military might of war elephants is now in question, how far does that reach? Have other authors maybe presented the elephant casualties that they've inflicted as higher, or when armies have routed because of the sight of them, are these now exaggerated? So now we've discussed the military aspect of elephants, and I think you can make your own decisions as to what you believe if they are a bit fabricated or exaggerated. But now let's focus on the political use of elephants. Now the first one I'm going to discuss is about a display of power, and this is most evident with Claudius in his invasion of Britain. With the invasion of Britain by the Romans in 44 AD, the Romans managed to defeat some of the southern British tribes. However, before taking the capital Colchester, Claudius halted Plautius, his general. This was so he would not make a triumphant entrance into the capital. Claudius himself wanted to be at the forefront of this entrance into Colchester and to show the might and gravitas of the Roman Empire. In the entourage he brought over for his special entrance, there was an inclusion of an elephant, where if some sources are to be believed, Claudius personally rode into Colchester on the back of that elephant. This would have been a highly impressive sight to the Britons, who had never seen an elephant prior to this experience. The largest animal that the Britons had ever seen was being ridden by the emperor of the largest empire in the known world, which just defeated all opposition that it faced in Britain. Truly a terrifying sight and one installed by Claudius to present an idea of betterment and dominance the Romans held over the Britons. Politically though, elephants were also used as a diplomatic tool. Elephants were often used as a bargaining chip in diplomatic deals throughout the Hellenistic period. The chief example of this is when Seleucus I made a deal with Chandragupta of the Marian Empire to give Chandragupta control of Arachosia in return for 500 war elephants and their mahouts. Other examples of this come from the Anabasis of Antiochus III when he expanded his empire easterly. After the submission of Euphodemus I of Batria to Antiochus III, Euphodemus gives Antiochus an unspecified amount of elephants as part of the peace deal. This happens again when Antiochus III goes into India and makes another treaty with an Indian king, Sophagusanus. Here Antiochus is also given an unspecified number of elephants. These events all show the significance of elephants in the Hellenistic world, as they are important enough, both military and symbolically, to be strongly desired by Hellenistic kings where they will give up large parts of their land, 
Another way that elephants are used politically is through imagery, specifically through coinage. So the image of an elephant was used as symbols of power by the Indians, the Persians, the Carthaginians and the Hellenistic kingdoms. One of the ways that the symbol of power was portrayed was by using the elephant's bust, body or skin in the use of coinage. This can be seen on Ptolemy I's coinage which depicted Alexander wearing the skin of an elephant which was then reproduced with Ptolemy himself also wearing a skin of an elephant. This was more than likely to emulate the legend of Heracles killing and wearing the skin of the Nemean lion. The use of elephants' faces were adopted by several Seleucid monarchs, who would have used this imagery as elephants were considered the largest, most robust creatures in the known world. It was also not a common occurrence to see an elephant for the common people, and therefore had an aspect of mystery surrounding them. Towards the east, it is also a tradition of association between elephants and kings. This was then replicated by some of the Hellenistic kingdoms, such as the Ptolemies and the Seleucids, which could also validate their own kingship. This is also evident in Carthage, where the symbol of elephants was depicted next to renowned generals, more than likely to portray a symbol of power and pride, something these creatures would have been able to exemplify to the common public at the time. So, in conclusion, war elephants, were they a success or were they a failure? I lean towards the fact that I believe they were a success in certain areas, but overall they were a failure. In the Hellenistic kingdoms, it was pretty much down to which elephant was the biggest and would it scare the other one away. As time progressed and when other kingdoms and empires started to fight against elephants more and learn how they reacted and fought, they became pretty much redundant because if you had missiles, you could, in theory, route a whole elephant unit without any casualties being inflicted on yourself. And even if they did start to engage with you, it seemed very easy at the end to be able to hamstring them, to make them immobile, or to route back into their own troops again, causing more casualties upon their own men. However, I do think they have been very useful for political reasons. And, I have to admit, militarily, if they are used in the correct ways to an opposition that have not faced anything like them before, then they can be used to a crippling effect. But in the timeline of antiquity, as you move closer and closer to the modern day, you can see that the elephant becomes less and less successful, maybe only with a few accounts where they've been managed to turn the tide and win the battle for their commanders. Thank you very much for listening to this episode of the AIQ podcast. I do hope you enjoyed it. We're not sure what the next episode of the AIQ podcast will be on, but we do know it will be out in January. So keep your eye out and look out for when we're uploading next. Thank you very much. Have a good day.